But when you saw it, you did not. You didn't believe. And you saw how John went there in a blaze of glory. John's death was even a greater testimony to his commitment. When he stood before Herod and said, Herod, you are a sinner, you are an adulterer, it's not right for you to take your brother Philip's wife, who you took his wife, you had Philip killed, and then y'all living as husband and his wife, you are an adulterer, Herod, and it's not right. And Herod had John locked up and put into prison. And from prison, John had his troubles. He had his challenges. John said, I came preaching this good news. I came preaching that the king was coming because he expected Jesus to come right behind him. Throw off the evil bad people. Set up the kingdom is what John was expecting. John didn't understand the mystery of the church. And so John is now in prison, and John is discouraged. John is at the borderline of being depressed. He says, I spent my whole life my whole life, John was saying, 29, 30 years preparing, had one year of ministry, and then I got through in jail, and then it looked like I made a mistake. It looked like I made a mistake. So John called some of his choice disciples. He said, I got one thing I want you to go to Jesus and ask them, is he really the one, or should I be looking for another one? And the Bible says that Jesus sent the messengers back to John, just go tell John that the blind are having their eyes open, the lames are being healed, the gospel's having, the, the poor are having the gospel preached unto them. Just go back and tell John that. And when they went back to the prison and gave John the message, John said, I'm all right with whatever happens now. Whatever happens, happens. He's the one, and there is not another one. And the Bible said that Herod threw a big party, and Herod in his drunken debauchery brought in Herodias' daughter, and she danced a vulgar, seductive dance before him, so much so that his hormones went crazy. He said, girl, you can have whatever you want up to half of my kingdom. What a ridiculous statement for the king to make to a young girl who had danced and almost barely knew before him. You can have whatever you want up to half of my kingdom. And she being coached by her mother, she said, you go and you tell him what you want. Tell him you want John the Baptist's head on a platter. And Herod now is pinned in the corner. He's made this public statement before all of his statesmen and before his cabinet that she could have anything she wanted up to half of the kingdom. And then he gave the order and had the executioners to chop off the Baptist's head. And it brought the Baptist head, the most powerful of the Old Testament prophets, died being beheaded. And they brought the prophet's head in on a platter and they delivered it to the girl. And the poor people went into mourning. And Jesus himself went into mourning because now he knew that his hour had come. Well, let me tell you, when you stand for what's right, might cost you your job, might cost you your head, it might cost you your neck, it might cost you something because standing for what's right is not an easy place to stand. But after John was beheaded, after they had the ceremony, they then came together, ate the potato salad, ate the bagels, ate the roasted lamb, and everybody went on back to work about their ordinary business, Jesus catapults on the scene. And the Bible said when Jesus catapulted on the scene and when Jesus posed his disciples, he says, well, who do men think that I am? Some think you're Elijah the prophet. Some think you're Jeremiah. But then there's another group. They think you're John the Baptist. The Baptist was that bad that when they put him in the ground, he preached from the ground and the people thought that he had got up from the dead. That's how powerful a righteous life is. A righteous life cannot be silenced when it's connected to Christ. A righteous message cannot be silenced when it's empowered by the Holy Spirit. So John the Baptist had even greater power after his death than he had before he was living. So much so that even Herod himself thought that John had got up from the dead. He thought that Jesus was a reincarnation of the Baptist. So let me tell you something. When Jesus evoked the name of the Baptist, don't you think 
it caused shells to go down their spine. They thought they had silenced the backwoods, illiterate, uncouth prophet who ate locusts and wild honey as his meal, didn't have the fine clothes, fine robes, didn't have nothing but camel's hair that he draped around his body. No sophistication. And they say, we can eliminate him and he'll be gone forever. And now her Jesus shows up on the scene and who is he invoking against them? Who is he bringing as a witness to testify against them? John the beheaded Baptist. And don't you think that that didn't put their teeth on edge? You say, you mean to tell me we ain't haven't got rid of Baptists yet? Jesus himself was still in his own faith. He had to go because he was bringing the Baptists back up, which they, he, they thought they'd gotten rid of. And they felt, they feared that this would re-incite the people against them. Oh, you're talking about a master that causing people to hang themselves with their own rope. That's Jesus of Nazareth. He let their own deeds, ignoring the Baptists, having the Baptists executed, let their own deeds come back to haunt them in his last days. Well, let me, let me kind of wrap things up. So he's, he's insulting these guys pretty severely. And then the final one, the one which I read in your hearing, he told them another parable. Certain land only, plants a vineyard, sets a hedge around it to protect his vineyard. See, we don't understand this. We don't understand the old world. We don't understand that the, that the vineyard owners, these were wealthy, powerful people. Because that in the part of the world, they did not have the sophisticated way of purifying the water like we do today. So, so wine was a staple. They, they drank wine in many cases because the water was not healthy for them to drink. And the way they got clean water was to take it through the process of producing wine. And it was not to get drunk on for all of them either. No, that's what it was about. They, had, they were trying to hydrate their bodies. So even Paul writes to Timothy. He writes to Timothy. He says, no, Timothy, you get upset all the time. Your nerves are bad. You got anxiety attacks. You got ulcers. The people down at the church at Ephesus, they're running you crazy. He says, the boy, every night, drink you a little bit of wine. Not to get drunk. As medicine. As medicine. All right? As medicine. He said, for your stomach's sake and for your often and firmness, it was for municipal purposes, for medical purposes. Now, we got all types of medication. Now, we got Maalox. We got all that type of business. We ain't got to be drinking wine. We get upset stomach, y'all. All right? We got all type of medical advancements. And so we don't have to be taking a little toddy for the body because medical science has pushed the envelope. And we got a lot of stuff up there we can take care of ourselves. But amen? <laughs> so, but when Jesus invokes the vine dresser, See, they, they would have perked up because vine dressers were respected. Vine dressers were landowners. Vine dressers were major entrepreneurs. Vine dressers were part of the economy. So he said, here's the story. This great vine dresser, he plants this huge vineyard. He sets this hedge of protection around it. He's protecting his vineyard from the onslaught. He's protecting his vineyard from predators. He's protecting his vineyard from those who would come in and to try to steal from his produce. He builds a tower up. So the watchman can look out and see who's trying to approach the vineyard. And then he went into a far country. And when it came time for the vintage time, now it's, came, it's vintage time, now it's time to pick the fruit, it's time to mash the fruit, it's time to create the wine at vintage time, at harvest time, that he might receive a return on his investment. So he sends his servants in, they, they beat his servants. And they kill his servants, one after another. He sent another group of servants, and they kill them likewise. Then at last, he sent his, his son. And he said, they're going to respect my son. They're going to revere my son because he's my son. And he's the heir. And they're going to respect him because they know they've been living off of the land that I own, that I planted. All the crops they harvested is because of my provision. So they're going to love and respect whatever belongs to me. So he sent his son to them. And Jesus said, they seized the heir. They killed the heir and said, we will get the inheritance. And they cast him out of the vineyard and they killed him. He says, now again, listen to this. This is a master at work here. This is an absolute master. Only 